Good evening and welcome to the last webinar in the three-part series, Parenting Webinars, A Whole New World, Parenting During a Pandemic. Brought to you by the Hemophilia Federation of America's Families Program. I'm Carrie Koenig, Program Director at HFA. Also on the line, we have Anne Lewak, VP of Education at HFA, and Dr. Juliana Bloom. As folks start coming in, I'm gonna take a moment to promote you all to panelists so that you are able to um, share video if you'd like and connect on more of a personal level. Um, but we will keep your um, audio muted for the duration of the webinar. And please feel free to utilize the chat or the Q&A tool at the bottom of your toolbar to, to ask any questions. We'll pass them on to Dr. Bloom. Um, all of these parenting webinars are being recorded and will be posted on HFA's YouTube channel for future reference. We would like to take just a moment to thank Takeda, CVS Health, Nova Nordisk, and Genentech for funding our families program. Without their generous donations, this webinar would not be possible. Today's presentation, A Whole New World, Parenting in a Pandemic, we have an extremely knowledgeable speaker, Dr. Juliana Bloom, who is based in Orlando, Florida, and Dr. Bloom is a licensed psychologist and pediatric neuropsychologist. She received her BA summa cum laude from Emory University and her master's of education and doctoral degrees from the University of Georgia. While at UGA, she conducted clinical research on neurobiological basis of dyslexia and ADHD. Dr. Bloom completed her internship and postdoctoral at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where she worked with children and adolescents with complex medical and neuro, neurological illnesses, including stroke, epilepsy, brain tumors, cancer, blood disorders, and traumatic brain injury, among others. Dr. Bloom's areas of clinical interest include dyslexia, ADHD, neuropsychological outcomes, and school reentry following acquired brain injury and medical illness, and medical trauma stress, traumatic stress in patients and families. She's the author of seven peer-reviewed journal articles, six invited book chapters, and more than 40 conference presentations. She's a member of the American Psychological Association and the International Neuropsychological Society. She loves spending her free time with her husband and two children. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, just want to remind you of the, that this is for educational purposes and not intended to be construed as medical advice. And with that, Dr. Bloom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you both for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, I wanna let you know that within, the, um, within Zoom, you can go to the chat feature if you have any questions. Um, I, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation or you can save questions up for later. Um, you're also, um, perfectly fine to unmute yourself and pop in with a question if you would like to. I want everyone to feel free to do that and we can make this feel a little bit interactive and a bit fun. So um, like, like uh, um, Anne said, I am a child psychologist and child and adolescent psychologist and I have two kids of my own and I have like many of you been homeschooling and working from home and managing and navigating all of the changes that have come along with this. And I want to share with you a bit about some things that I'm seeing in my patients and how we can navigate the parenting during this really stressful time, particularly with teenagers who are a very challenging group, as I'm sure that you all know, and that's why you are here. Um, so I'm really excited to be with you guys. Another relevant factor is that although I don't have a child with a bleeding disorder, I do have a child with an autoimmune disease. And they're definitely not the same. I understand that. But I understand the additional stresses that come with parenting a child who has an extra medical condition. And so, and I've also did a lot of training in that um, in my internship and postdoc at the Children's Hospital. So um, I wanna let you know that I'm coming from that perspective and understand that perspective as well. So I don't know about you, but it's been a long, how many months has it been? Um, two and a half months, almost three months. Um, and on the first day, a lot of us felt like Mary Poppins. We're going to do this. We're going to stay home. We're excited. We got the adrenaline course in. And then um, it starts to take its toll after a period of time. And I think that's where a lot of us are at this particular moment where it's kind of wearing on us. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of, oh, make this, make special time, make, make the best of the special time with your child. And also I need some space from these kids. And then it's really about, you know, I think both, everyone is having both of those feelings. Um, and so I wanna just normalize that a bit for you guys and say that that is a normal way to feel that you're very happy to have everybody home and you also are dying to get out of the house and get some space. And your kids are probably feeling somewhat that same way. So I wanna talk for a minute about why this is so hard. Um, one of the reasons is because as a world, as a collective experience, we have never done this before. We can't go to our parents and say, how did you handle this? Because they have never done this before. This has been one of the only times in the world since the 1918 flu pandemic that really people have gone into quarantine and isolation in this kind of way. Um, it's, you know, at that time they did have social distancing, they did have quarantine, they had isolation, but it's certainly different than it is now. Um, the, just our society is different, our work life is different, what our kids were used to is different, um, and, how things, and how things work and how much news we have available to us is different. 90% of kids are out of school because of this pandemic in the world, in the entire world. So that just tells you the gravity of it and how big it's been and how much it's impacted all of us. The other thing is that because the whole world is experiencing this at the same time, there is not, it's, it's not like, you know, I live in Florida, we have hurricanes. If one part of the state gets hit by a hurricane, other parts of the state help out, other states help out, the federal government helps out. But in this particular case, everyone is experiencing this at the same time. And because of that, people are sometimes competing for resources instead of helping one another. There's, there's not that pathway out of this and there's not that perspective. Okay, so the kids are really experiencing a huge loss here. Um, so their world has shrunk significantly, especially teenagers whose world was expanding significantly has now shrunk. They're losing their routine, their education. Um, they don't have the same access to their friends, their coaches or their teachers. Virtual is definitely good, but it's not the same. Um, and they're losing that ability to have these challenges to overcome the things that were challenging them and their independence. And you know, for teenagers, that's really important to them, their independence. Parents who are normally the helpers in the situation, um, we normally are there for, for our kids and we normally help them. Well, we're stretched far beyond our own capacity because all of a sudden um, we don't have those supports that we used to have. You might be isolated from grandparents or neighbors who are helpful. You might have working at home and having to navigate that and it's different. Um, you're navigating homeschooling. Maybe you're an essential worker, in which case your job requirements have gone up tremendously because of the virus. Or maybe even you're being directly impacted by the virus in terms of, you know, there's been a layoff, job loss, work has been cut, or you're dealing with the virus um, firsthand, in which case your capacity, you know, you're, you're very focused on that. It's a huge job, people who are essential workers. Um, so this has been challenging for everybody. Everybody's a bit pushed to the max, especially families. Um, one thing that, um, so our retired neighbors who will sometimes see from 20 feet away while we're walking the dog will tell us how bored they are. And my husband and I will look at each other and go, bored? I mean, we're, we're so busy between the kids and the work, but it's, it's ironic that people who are single, who are living alone, are experiencing that sense of boredom. Um, I think we're experiencing a sense of monotony. Every day feels the same, but our days are very full and busy. Um, and so that, that's definitely a stretch. So to talk about the impact on the bleeding disorder community briefly, um, my understanding is that there's no reason to believe that COVID is gonna impact the bleeding disorder community more so than other people, which is a relief I'm sure to many. Um, but it is important to understand that there's a huge financial stress. So we now know that there's been huge job loss, um, loss of health insurance. That's a huge stressor, um, especially for this community. And so that's an important thing um, to, to keep in mind that that's a stressor and you know, that that's something that's impacting everybody nowadays. So this really is not normal. This is not how humans were designed to be. We are social creatures. Learning is a social activity. Um, development through the teenage years is a social activity. And 
what's happening is that, you know, quarantine itself, just being quarantined, um, which we have research on, not from this pandemic, that research is starting to dribble out a little bit, but we don't have a lot of research on what the social emotional effects are of this pandemic yet. But we know that quarantine itself is linked with some post-traumatic stress symptoms. Um, this is, you know, cases of like people who are quarantined because they had been exposed to Ebola or um, something along, or measles, something along those lines, they had to be quarantined in their homes. Um, everybody is fearing for themselves or their loved ones, either health-wise, financially, um, logistically, emotionally, um, especially those who are essential workers and those who are at risk. The economic and financial worries are big, even if you haven't been let off from your job, there's still those worries about will it be there in six months. Um, homeschooling is a big a big job for all of us. It's been very challenging, I know, in, in our home and for a lot of people. And the kids need a lot more um, right now. They, they need, you know, before their peers and their teachers and their coaches were providing a lot, but they need more emotionally right now, educationally and socially, and, and so do the parents. It's, it's challenging for all of us. So I wanna kind of introduce a way of thinking about this, um, which is acute stress. So um, what happens when there is a major stressful event or a major change in life is that the, that little um, yellow part that you see highlighted in the brain there called the amygdala is the part of the brain that is the fear response. It's what puts you in that fight, flight, or freeze reaction whenever there is a fear stimulus. And um, what happens is because of that stressful event, the, the amygdala causes other parts of the brain to release a huge amount of cortisol and adrenaline. So if during the first few weeks of the pandemic, you were having difficulty sleeping, um, if you were very anxious or agitated, that's, that's somewhat of the reason why the amygdala does that. Um, it's very helpful in the short term. So if you are running from a tiger and it really gets your heart rate going, it puts blood to your muscles, it makes you breathe faster, and that's great to help you run away from the tiger, but it's not so great when there is an invisible virus and economic collapse that is everywhere um, that doesn't really help you, you know, with cope with that. So the adrenaline eventually wears off. And I think that's where a lot of us are, where this is all feeling pretty exhausting. Um, and but if but if the amygdala is still releasing a lot of those hormones, that chronic anxiety is really not good for your body in the long run. It can lead to you know heart problems and um, a lot of difficulties, sleep problems. I think a, a big one that a lot of people are having. Overall, having a little bit of anxiety is a really useful thing right now. It keeps you socially distanced. It keeps you careful when you're you know getting supplies. It makes you wash your hands for 20 seconds. That anxiety is very, very useful in terms of keeping you safe. But a large amount of anxiety, which might be coming from the amygdala, is, is not so useful. So that's what's happened to everybody's brains. And especially in the first month, that was probably a lot of what was happening. So after the first month, you can end up having symptoms of what we call post-traumatic stress. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's diagnosable. You can have this at a level where it becomes a disorder, you can have a more low-lying level of it, but it's sometimes very helpful to be aware of what the symptoms are and think about how that is relating to what's going on in your mind. So there's symptoms, um, the symptoms of post-traumatic stress are hyperarousal, which might lead to some of that difficulty sleeping, that might be, you know, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, um, symptoms of re-experiencing, um, so kind of getting put back to a place where you're experiencing the trauma. A lot of that's happening in dreams. Um, you know, so um, people are having dreams that they're at school and then all of a sudden school is canceled and people are running and screaming. You know, there's lots of dreams that people are having, nightmares that are making it difficult. And then sometimes avoidance, avoidance of talking about, um, talking about the virus, talking about the situation. Sometimes it's avoidance of, um, you know, things that remind you of what life was like before. So for example, for quite a while, um, my daughter did not want to participate in her Zoom calls at all, because it was just a reminder of the fact that she wasn't able to be at school where she wanted to be. Um, and so, like I said, you can have some of those symptoms at a subclinical level, 
and it's not diagnosable, but it still is related to how your brain processes a traumatic event. So the important thing to understand about this is that um, the amygdala, which is right there in red, which is that fear center, that is right next to two important parts of the brain. One part of the brain is the hippocampus, and that's the area that lays down new memories. So that was the part that was responsible for learning, for encoding new information, for learning how to do new skills. So if the technology the first few weeks was frustrating, and it probably was legitimately frustrating, um, then I will say that you know part of the problem was that the, your brain is activated, your amygdala is activated, and your learning brain is not activated if your amygdala is activated. There's two brains, the fear brain and the learning brain. And they work against each other because when you're fearful, you're not in a good state to be able to learn. And so we were asking everybody to transition to distance learning and then also asking people to continue learning um, when they were really in an emotional state where they probably physically couldn't do that. The next part is the prefrontal cortex. And that is part of the brain we're going to talk about a bit today that is really important to um, the teenagers. That is the part that's developing a lot. And that is the part that they use to do things that adults can do that kids can't do. So if you think of anything that an adult can do that children are not capable of doing, that's probably happening in that frontal cortex of your brain, the frontal lobes of your brain. And um, that would be things like planning, um, organizing, sustaining attention even when it's boring, um, problem solving, and emotional regulation. So the amygdala really shuts down a lot of that area for emotional regulation. And so you can maybe think back to some of your teenagers' behavior and think, well, that's where that was coming from. All right, so talking specifically about adolescence, um, and we'll talk a little bit about young adults. So the group I'm talking about is about 13 to maybe about 22. Um, what, what we know, there's gonna be a large variability within that group, by the way. A 13-year-old is gonna react very differently than a 20-year-old. But there's some commonalities and we'll try to keep it you know, together with that. We know that teenagers are less, get, less at risk from the disease. We know that they um, don't seem to have as many complications um, as kids, uh, as older adults um, or people who have chronic illnesses. There are some exceptions, of course. Um, and so, you know, if you're vulnerable for some reason, if a child has, you know, some sort of autoimmune disease or type one diabetes, um, those kids do cancer survivors, they do seem to be a bit more vulnerable. But overall, teenagers are less at risk for getting a very severe manifestation of the disease. However, they've probably suffered more um, in terms of the disruption to their lives than any other age group. And I'll talk about that a little bit more about why it's so difficult for the teenagers. Um, they're having huge grief, and I think that's probably the best way to describe it, over missing prom, missing graduation ceremonies, missing whatever um, particular life cycle events they were going through or expecting to have. Um, one of my friends has a child who, um, you know, the senior skip day was, he was a senior going off to college, Senior skip day was canceled, prom was canceled, graduation was canceled, all of the parties and rituals around that were canceled for him, but he still had to take five AP exams in a week. And so, you know, that it, so the good parts were canceled and the bad parts were not. Um, and that same kid is going off to college and is very, and this is true of I think a lot of kids who are going off to college, they're very worried about like, what is that gonna look like? They're not gonna have a typical freshman experience. There's a, a loss associated with that. Also the kids who are graduating and moving on, um, you know, they, they, if they're graduating from college at this point, that's a very big thing to be moving on from. If you're graduating from middle school, moving on to high school, um, not seeing those friends again, you didn't know that that was gonna be your last day. And while this seems like it's pretty trivial, and compared to the people who are, you know, 100,000 people have lost their lives, and there's so many people who are, are working so hard and are putting themselves at risk and who have lost their jobs. Um, the grief over the loss of those rituals and life cycle events is a real thing for your, your, your child. It is a real loss for your child, and I don't want to trivialize it. Um, it's a good thing to put it in perspective and to help the kids put it in perspective, but it is a real, a real grief for them, and so we should, we should treat it as such. 
There's also a lot of uncertainty about the future for kids. Like I said, you know, moving on, um, they don't know exactly what things are gonna look like, particularly those who are transitioning. Um, you know, if you're transitioning from seventh grade to eighth grade, it's probably not as big of a transition as if you're, you know, suddenly you're done with middle school and going to high school or done with high school and you don't know what college is gonna be like, or you're done with college and you don't know what the job prospects are. And that's something that's very worrisome. What is, what is this gonna look like for me? So there's a lot of uncertainty and that leads to a lot of chronic anxiety. So to talk quickly about the five stages of grief. Um, so we're talking about the grief that's associated with it. Um, even little, little events like missing your prom, there's a grief associated with that. That's very real to kids, even though it seems maybe trivial to us, maybe it doesn't, but for um, the kids, it's a very real thing. Um, and so the stages, of course, are denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance. And so you might see your kids go through some of those things. You might see them go through it if they're losing the opportunity to go to camp or have a job this summer. Um, those are some things you might see with that as well. Just so you know, for these stages, they don't happen in a linear order. They can happen at various times. You can move through you can move from denial to straight to depression and then go back at other stages. You can be in acceptance and then go back to anger. Um, so there's a lot of moving around that can happen with this, but you, some of the behavior that you're seeing in your teens might be somewhat related to the grief and loss surrounding their independence and autonomy in these events. Okay. All right, so sadness is another thing that we see a lot. Um, because this is very sad. There, there's been a big loss when it comes to this. And, you know, it's also pretty easy to move into, um, you know, when, when you're so socially distanced and you're not getting to spend time with your friends, um, sadness can look like a lot of things. Kids and teenagers do not express sadness exactly the way adults do. They really often present with irritability over anything else. So um, anger is one symptom that you might see, kind of resisting the frustration, um, kind of being tired all the time. That's something that we call anhedonia, um, which is lack of interest in activities that you would find pleasurable. Um, numbing out is something that I think a lot of teens are really doing right now. They have such big feelings that they actually can't handle them and they just choose to numb a bit. Um, so that might be, you know, the, the long periods of video games or surfing um, YouTube or various, you know, sites with their friends. Um, displaced frustration, so they might be taking it out on you quite a bit. It's an off, often thing that kids do. And um, boredom. I really feel like I'm bored is code for I'm sad, especially in this age range where they can probably do a lot of things. So I want to talk a little bit about teenagers specifically. So teenagers have a very specific developmental job. So just like a newborn and baby's developmental job was to attach to you and to be comforted by you and, um, and to learn how to eat and to walk, a teenager's developmental job that their DNA is just crying out for them to do is to develop is to separate from you. Um, the goal is, of course, to relate to raise fully functional adults, and part of that comes with not being dependent on mom and dad, and some of that, and that comes with separating. So they're forming their own identity. They're learning empathy. They're developing social skills, and the problem is, is that all of those things that they're doing comes by peer interaction. So that is actually how they develop their developmental job, that's how they accomplish their developmental job, is by interacting with their peers. Peers are actually more important to kids than parents during parts of the teen years. It's kind of hard for us to hear, but it, it is true. And um, this, that's why social distancing really has such a huge impact on them, is that it's stifling their development. And we're going to see educational loss, but we're also going to see big social emotional loss as we come out of this pandemic. Um, they have been trying so hard to become independent, to be responsible. They're growing up. And then all of a sudden, they don't have any of those jobs to do anymore. Um, you know, in terms of the, the online school, it's just different in terms of you don't have to you're not going out into the world and navigating. You don't have to remember what supplies to bring. If you forget something, it's in the next room. Um, so it, it's challenging for them. 
Um, also, remember that amygdala that I showed you before? That is fully developed in teens, but it, they are wired in a way that they don't experience fear quite as strongly. Basically, their brains are somewhat programmed to take risks, and they're not as sensitive to threat as an adult brain. And so, um, you know, that might be why it's sometimes hard to keep them in the house and socially distanced. There's um, huge grief and loss around those life cycle events. I talked about that. And because they have difficulty, you know, their frontal lobes are still developing and those amygdalas are, are firing and they're not very sensitive to threat, they don't really understand always why they need to socially distance um, because they don't have as much empathy. So that's part of what's going on and making it more challenging for parents right now. Um, there are some positives. Let me make sure, yeah. There are some positives. Um, so what we're hearing from um, teenagers nowadays is that sleep is a big positive. Not waking up early, early in the morning to catch the bus is a very big positive. Um, they feel in general like the schedules are a little less rushed and a little, little less hectic. There's less academic pressure there's less peer pressure and they're benefiting from kind of more time to explore some interests that they can do a little bit more deeply and having more time i think it's a benefit that they potentially because things are less rushed and hectic have more time to connect with the parents so i want to talk really quick about online school um, a few parts of the country are, are slowing down or shutting down but many people are still going um, and I don't know about you guys, but I took exactly one online class in graduate school and it was incredibly hard for me. I can't imagine doing six at once. Um, and I was you know, 23 by then, 25, so that's different. Um, and then it's crashing, the Wi-Fi isn't great. You have to share a device with your siblings or in my kid's case with their mom, um, trapped at home, filled with fear and anxiety. So I'm just saying it's, it's very difficult for the kids. Um, and so the, particularly the online schooling for teenagers, I think has been challenging. I'm hearing stories of, you know, there's three different places that their assignments are in. It's very hard to keep track. Um, so it's a challenge for sure. So talking a little bit about the brain, um, you know, there's some parts of the adolescent brain that are not fully online yet. And that really has to do a lot with those executive functioning skills. So this is actually a map of the cortex of the brain developing. And you can see, um, you know, age five, adolescence around age 13 versus age 20. Do you see how that blue in the front of the brain really has not come on board nearly as much until they're about 20? We actually now have data showing that it continues to develop the frontal lobes until they're about 25. Around the age of 14, there starts to be new growth in the front part of the brain. And while that's happening, everything kind of goes haywire. Um, and they, you know, because there's actually two, the way the brain grows is there's too many cells that are developed and then they prune back the ones that they don't need. So you almost have this huge overgrowth and misfiring of the frontal lobes that's happening during the adolescent years and it makes it really challenging for them to control their behavior and emotions because the behavior and emotions part is fully developed the frontal lobes are not um, so but they believe that they're very independent and that they're completely rational so it makes it more challenging so it is a period of so this is a time of rapid learning and brain development it is also a period of opportunity so um, there's key brain systems that are going online and this is a really crucial time to invest in your child is during their adolescent years um, that has made, been made in some ways easier and in many ways more difficult by the pandemic so what we know is that the adolescent brain is pretty sensitive to stressors probably more sensitive than the school age brain um, and the toddler and preschoolers, they are definitely having a hard time and they have a lot of behavioral regressions, but um, they, they also are very happy to be home with their parents who are the most important people in the world to them. The adolescent brain has kind of been starved of what it needs for a period of time. Um, what we know is that mass events can have longer lasting impacts and um, 
longer lasting negative impacts on the adolescent brain than other brains. So whereas you as an adult might get over what ha is happening because of the pandemic, it might take them a bit hard, longer of a time. And it's really crucially important to promote skills that support resilience. Um, because you know, having a stressor is not an entirely bad thing. Um, it can make you stronger. It can teach you new coping skills. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, but we want to make sure that um, the stressor doesn't lead in a negative kind of way. So one of the things that I want to talk about is there's positive spirals that can happen in the adolescent brain and there's negative spirals. Um, and this is, this is kind of 9 to 14, but there's, there's more to it than that. So if you um, allow adolescents to explore some healthy versions of risk taking, okay, things that are, that are, that are socially responsible, um, and the adults support that, and adults give them more responsibilities, um, they end up with really improved self-confidence, and they can take appropriate risks and be vulnerable and grow and learn. And it kind of creates a cycle where they've learned that they can be okay if they try something and it doesn't work, and then they can problem solve and fix it and keep trying. Whereas if you have a, um, the, the negatives, the negative interaction can be much more negative and lead to a negative spiral. So um, what happens is, and we're talk about this some more, the biological changes lead them to want to stay up later, well, require them to stay up later. And they get the, like, for example, if you have a lot of social action, interaction and technology, then those late bedtimes, and if you have bad sleep, you end up with kind of a, a social jet lag, meaning that um, they're spending their social time, you know, not um, it's spending their social time and it's at the expense of their sleep. And those problematic behavior, if they're not getting enough sleep, it can really have a much bigger effect on their brains in terms of their emotions, their intention and their health than it can on an adult brain. So, um, but we'll talk about why it might be okay for them to be spending some time in, um, sometimes staying up late talking with friends too. It's just a matter of they need to make sure that they get that sleep. So there's kind of like good, good spirals and there's negative spirals. Parenting teenagers, some tips, understanding their brains. And I hope that this um, talk has, has helped a bit and understanding their developmental needs and why things are so hard. Um, the kind of parenting that needs to be done with a teenager is a bit more hands-off than it would be with a school-age child. As they start to assert their independence, um, as long as you feel like they can make safe choices and the risks are within control, you know, so their acceptable level of risk, um, allow them to take those risks, allow them to make mistakes, and, you know, not a lot of I told you so or this is how you should do it, not a lot of direction, but more a lot of questioning. So, um, okay, well, you've made a decision to pick this, this person for that project. Tell me why you made that decision. Um, how is that going? Is it happening the way that you thought it would? And really asking them questions and just being supportive as opposed to directing. And that's a really important thing to do with kids this age. It'll also keep them coming back for more um, when they're not, not being judged and questioned, when the questions are really open and more like, well, how did that make you feel? How's that working out? What do you think you should do next? Not directing them, well, I think you need to do this next, but saying, what do you think you need to do next? And you might find out that they think they need to do exactly what you thought that they needed to do because they've been watching you and they've been learning for you from their whole development. Um, so allowing them to make their own mistakes and not solving their problems for them is a great way to get them to grow up in the right way and to have that positive trajectory. You do, however, you have the role to keep them safe and to um, make sure that there is still respect and order in your house. Um, so you want to set limits, um, you want to be consistent about them, and you want to be calm about them. Um, those of you who have teenage girls know that there's nothing that they love better than a good argument. So you don't have to participate into every argument which you're invited to. Um, you also want to allow them and encourage to keep on their developmental level by allowing them to have socialization. At this point, it might be very limited. It might be mostly online. Um, there might be a few people that you're allowing them to interact with. 
um, but you want to allow that to happen. So what's, what's happening a lot is pretty much kids are becoming nocturnal. Um, so, you know, they're, their parents are going to bed and they're up um, having, you know, kind of online parties or um, spending time alone. And it's a bit of a way of them um, escaping their parents and the situation that they're in and having some independence is to be awake when their parents are asleep. Um, and, and that can be okay. Um, it, within reason. So, you know, if I'm hearing about kids going, staying up until two or three in the morning, that seems reasonable to me. Um, as long as they're getting things done, as long as they're basically meeting their, their exercise needs, as long as they're getting their, their nutritional needs, as long as they're spending some time with the family in the day, that's fine. Um, when I'm hearing about kids who are going to sleep at 9 a.m., that has a little bit more concern for me. So, um, you know, one thing that you can do with an older kid who you don't really have control over is to say, okay, well, what is a hard stop on the wake up time? Like agree on what a wake up time needs to be and try to stick to that, but then not control their bedtime necessarily. Of course, the situation is different for a 13 year old. You're still allowed to have a bedtime for your 13 year old. But if you've got a college age student who's at home, you know, they're pretty independent. You kind of got to let that go. It, all, it really is very individual to the child and to where they are in development because not every 15 year old is the same as every other 15 year old it's really about judging your individual child and what limits and responsibilities are appropriate for them but parents tend to give a little keep it a little too close and oftentimes teenagers are less combative and do better if they're given a little bit more autonomy so maybe think about ways that you can um, encourage that in your child also modeling respect so um, sometimes they're disrespectful and they can certainly have consequences for that as long as you always model respect going back toward them um, eventually that should pass so ways to kind of help our teenagers be more resilient in terms of our parenting is you're really normalizing their feelings kind of talking to them about what's happening um, in their brain, talking to them about how hard this is, talking to them about what they're experiencing, um, and give them some outlets to express their emotions without any judgment. Um, focus on connections, what you can, how you can connect with them, and how they can be given opportunities to connect with their peers in a way that's safe and appropriate. Um, and I am a big believer in everyone in the family contributes to the family. And chores are a great way, actually, of kids, um, them participating in the family in a way that maybe they've been too busy to learn. Maybe the kid doesn't know how to do his laundry. Maybe the kid needs, this is a great opportunity during the pandemic for that to become a life skill that they learn. Or how to cook a meal. Um, you know, a high schooler is perfectly capable of cooking a meal for the family. Just everybody has to learn how to do it. Um, I've heard of some teenagers who, you know, the families decided we want to build a fence and the teenagers said, okay, I'm in, let's do it. Or they um, have done different projects together around the house with their parents. If that's not happening. That's fine. You don't have to make that happen, but you can just model it, invite them. And if they say, no, that's fine. And then maybe in an hour, they'll come and join you because they're pretty bored. Um, creativity is a really great thing for kids, especially now. It gives them an outlet to express their emotions. And, you know, one positive of the pandemic is that, you know, some kids who've been really creative souls, um, but have had such packed schedules that they haven't been able to do it, are having time to be able to draw, to write music, to play music, um, you know, to do things and build skills that they didn't, weren't able to really have the time to get into before. Um, and a little creativity is good for everybody. In general, I'm a fan of routine instead of schedules. Schedules are a bit hard limits. Um, but in, I think that a routine is a good thing. Um, one thing to think about is, um, you know, setting an expectation in your house that before they're, the kids engage in some sort of pleasurable activity, like, you know, watching TV or video games or um, socializing on social media with their friends, that they maybe should have some basics covered. So very simple in terms of contributing to the family in some sort of chore, um, getting their schoolwork done, getting some exercise. Um, those are some basics in terms of these are things that you should be doing before you can engage in these electronics and trying to set up that expectation and model that can be really helpful. Easier said than done though. I do understand that. Okay, so everybody really wants to talk about screen time. 
Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Well, I know one piece of medical advice I won't be following, and it is the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines on screen time, which if you recall, used to be a limit of two hours a day. Um, well, that's not reasonable right now. And um, the good news is that the American Pediatrics Academy of Pediatrics knows that. And they suggest that these be limits, especially as um, online school is going. They say, we understand that you have to be using screens. Screens are important to connect socially and you have to use it for the distance learning. But they do suggest that you try to have four hours a day where you are not on screens and that the screens be limited to no screens at meals and no screens in the bedrooms, or I hate to have to say it, but the bathrooms. Um, and the bedrooms are really important for sleep. So basically what they're saying is, we understand that this is a special time. Um, screens have a real benefit at this time. Make sure that kids still get exercise and that the screen doesn't interfere with family relationships or sleep. Um, and make some time for family activities and connectedness if your kids are willing to participate in them. Don't force it. Um, they said specifically for preschool and school age to monitor content, but of course, you're gonna wanna monitor content even now. Um, just today, I heard from a fellow psychologist whose um, son was being approached from somebody on social media um, who was most likely grooming that child you know, to engage in inappropriate photos and so forth. And she really, um, is extremely careful about monitoring the content. So do check the history, do check, um, do check you know, what's going on, what your kids are doing social media wise, you know you have to be aware of it, it's important. Okay, so overall, um, understand the trauma, the brain development, focus on the parts of your relationship with your child that you can control, and sometimes that means letting go and letting them make some mistakes, but they'll learn a lot more from that mistake than they will from you lecturing them. Um, focus on ways that you can possibly connect with your teen, but don't force it. Um, and really, a lot of this has to do at this point, um, I think that this pandemic has caused us all to really need to think about our own coping skills as parents so that we can rise to the occasion that's been presented to us. So um, resilience techniques, grit, perseverance, and a healthy dose of compassion for yourself and for your adolescent and modeling those coping skills. So modeling, you know, really your teenager, even though their primary, um, their, their primary influence at this point is their peers, they really do um, still watch you and you are still an influence to them. And if they see you praying, if they see you meditating, if they see you exercising, they will decide that that's something that they wanna do to help them cope with their own emotions when they're encountering it. Okay, so sleep. It's important to know that adolescents need nine to 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, the sleep delay due to hormones, however, the puberty makes it so that they cannot fall asleep as early as a school-age child or an adult. So there is a big lag in sleep onset, and that happens with the onset of puberty. So school start times have been a really major issue because it's, you know, a lot of the high schoolers are chronically sleep deprived. Um, so, you know, right now that has been taken away and it's a positive that I've heard from a lot of families is this has been a major life changing thing for us is that everyone's able to get more sleep. Um, unfortunately, some kids are becoming nocturnal. We talked about that already. Um, I went a little ahead. Um, so allow them some space, but monitor and decide what's acceptable in your family for a hard stop wake up time. So at this point, it might be that your teenager, especially over the summer, wakes up in time to join you for lunch. That seems reasonable to me. If they're waking up to join you for dinner, probably not so much. So how do we as adults build that resilience? Um, you know, meditation has been shown to really um, actually activate those frontal lobes and help us become more compassionate and less reactive so we can think before we react to something. Prayer has very similar benefits. Um, another way to think about it is two things called two types of distancing. One is psychological distancing. So you can think if I were in this situation and I were talking to a friend, what advice would I have, would that friend have for me? Or if my friend called me and said, this is what my life is like, what should I do? What would I advise them? And sometimes giving that distance really sets you on the path of, you know, 
it helps you understand what it is that you need to do and gets you out of your own head a bit and able to see what the path is. The other is temporal distancing. So something I like to think about is, okay, this pandemic will end at some point. When I look back upon it, what do I want to say about how I managed it? What do I want to say about how I parented through it? What do I say about how I worked through it and how we went through it as a family? So I think that those kinds um, of distancing techniques can be really, really helpful. Another thing is, you know, particularly if you've got a big group of you in a house, the family gap plan, I think is really good, particularly, you know, if you are fortunate to have another caregiver in your home, um, you know, kind of saying, well, my battery level, we do this a lot, my battery level is I'm at 20% today, I'm really run down. And I, I feel like I'm going to need to tap out. And the other person can say, well, I'm at 80%. So I can take over tonight. Why don't you have a little bit of time? And then it might be reversed the next day. And so understanding, you know, what's happening in terms of where everybody is in the reservoir, because everyone's emotions are going so up and down. So that family gap plan can be a really helpful tool for communicating kind of where you are. And, you know, um, our kids have started to see my husband and I use it and be able to say, you know, about my daughter said my battery is at eight percent and so i said okay well what do you need to kind of recharge your battery and so we've been able to have the flexibility because of the pandemic to put some of that into place um it helps a lot for kids in general and especially for adolescents if they see adults having conversations about emotions paying attention to their emotions and caring for their own emotions um, it, it models for them that that's what they need to be doing and that will help with some of that, you know, explosiveness or withdrawal that you can get in adolescence. Um, another thing is, um, these are just some things that I really like. Um, I do use the call map for meditation. We know that meditation has very proven scientific benefits. Um, and I do think it helps make you a calmer, less reactive person and parent. Um, and also the Happiness Lab is a, is a very cool podcast. It's actually a, it was a course that was taught at Yale on the science of happiness. And it just provides a lot of techniques for um, thinking about things differently and what, what techniques like the psychological and temporal distancing that comes from the Happiness Lab. Um, and that is a great resource that anybody can access either on podcast or on YouTube, the, the, the classes on YouTube. And then um, a new podcast called Unlocking with Brene Brown. Um, that's where the family gap plan is from. So I want to um, reference her with that and give her credit. Um, and those are very, very helpful in terms of kind of finding ways to cope. And there's a lot of other resources too in, in terms of coping strategies. So in short, we're under a lot of pressure. And I wanna say, I think this quote from Mr. Rogers is perfect. Some days doing the best we can might still be short of what we would like to be able to do, especially now as we're all torn in so many different directions. Life isn't perfect on any front, and doing what we can with what we have is the most we should expect of ourselves or anyone else. And I want you to think about that also for your teenager. Your teenager is learning a lot, and they are definitely um, feeling a lot of pressure, and they're, they're feeling a lot of grief and sorrow. And so um, understanding that, you know, under, having that compassion, you know, for them and for yourselves, I think is really important. So I want to leave you with some resources. First of all, it's important to know that if anybody in the home is you know, talking about harming themselves or really feeling down um, at an emergency basis, you can always go to an emergency room or call 911. There's also, of course, suicide hotlines. But if you feel like someone in your home needs help, that is the thing to do. Call 911 or go to the ER. Um, a lot of us are not in that space, but might need a little bit of extra support. And therapy is really, really effective. But don't wait too long. Don't wait until things are out of control. Um, therapy can really help. Early intervention is really key. We talked about the positive and negative spirals in adolescence. A positive spiral, you know, therapy can take you from a negative spi spiral to a positive spiral. Licensed mental health counselors or licensed psychologists are there to help you. You can get referrals either from your pediatrician or your hematologist. Um, or you can go on the APA psychologist locator, um, which can be really helpful as well. And that's all that I have for you guys today. I hope there's lots of questions for me. Hi, Carrie. Hi, 
Dr. Bloom. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. If there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and um, hop in to ask Dr. Bloom a question. Uh, Dr. Bloom, someone just texted me a question asking, um, they hear and see people on social media saying that their children are, you know, they're having these great family bonding times with their teenagers and, oh, we're playing games and, <laughs> and everything seems, you know, uh, hunky-dory, but um, what if you're not experiencing that and you're really having a difficult time connecting with your adolescent or young adult children? Um, any suggestions? I think probably the people who are saying that they're connecting or pr and having these great family experiences um, are, are probably not the norm. I think in general that there's a lot, the teenagers, like I've explained, are going through a really hard time and their job is to be connecting with their peers and not with you. And so it, it is very understandable if that is not what is happening. Um, but I would want to rule out and I'd want, you know, that parent to look at their child and say, is there any chance that my child's really depressed? Is there any chance that there's something going on which is um, keeping us from being connected? Is there something that's wrong with them? Is there something that is, you know, strained in our relationship? Um, so it's certainly worth addressing, but I think everyone's having a tough time and that's normal. So, you know, if you've ruled out that, you know, no, generally we have a pretty good relationship and no, they seem perfectly happy when they talk to their friends um, and there's no major warning signs. And I think it's probably just a bit of adjustment is still happening. And this is very hard for teenagers. Thank you. Does that help? Uh, it looks like, yes, that's what they're looking for. Okay. You know, the people who are uh, posting on social media about all these, it's always, it is always, you know, the, only the good times that they're posting. I've yet to see anyone post um, a teenager rolling their eyes or yelling at their parents or, you know, we just don't post those moments. So, you know, we think they don't happen, but they do. They happen to everybody. Good point. Um, actually, this is from me. I know that in the, the previous webinars, you have mentioned things about, you know, that 15 minutes with each of your children of undivided attention. Any suggestions on, you know, like time-wise with, with the teens and, and young adults? Would you adjust that time? Um, any way to get them to sit and spend that time? <laughs> no, that's why I didn't mention it this time, um, because it's not as effective with teenagers. Look, if you can get them to do it, it's great. Um, you know, the, the point of kind of special time um, that I've talked about in the ones on toddlers and school age kids is a, is a non judgmental time that you spend with your child just engaging with them in something that they enjoy. And I still think that's a great thing to do with your teen if you can. You just might not have a cooperative team to do it, and that might have nothing to do with you and everything to do with where your child is in development. But when those moments do come up, you know, trying to be as friendly as Un, you know, unintimidating, not asking a lot of questions, just being open-ended, curious, following their lead, that will get you a long way and they might be more likely to come back for more because they still do need you. I mean, there's no question that they need you. They're just trying not to need you. And so that creates, you know, a, <laughs> a challenge in and of itself. You know, um, you can also ask them, you know, if they're old enough, you can say, look, I would really love to have a chance to connect with you. I know that your friends are really important. I want you to have plenty of time for that. Can we just do one family thing a day, you know, have dinner together or play a game after dinner, just something that we can maybe take a walk together, walk the dog together, you know, just, you can ask them and say, look, I, I love you and I really want to connect with you and, and ask for their mercy. <laughs> 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 and just be, be very careful what you use that time for and make it positive. Well, not to make this all about me, but I'm going to ask another question. I don't see anything hoping that other people will ask, but since I do have children of this age, um, as you were talking about the sleep uh, pattern, the change in sleep patterns, um, I sent my daughter a message and said, um, Dr. Bloom's talking about you right now. And she said, what have you told her about me? And, Everyone. And, no, but she's talking about 
<laughs> the lack of sleep. She said, did you tell her that I stayed up for 26 hours straight the other day? And I said, well, no, I haven't mentioned that yet. But <laughs> So when you said, when you were talking about that, that really struck a chord with me because that has been a real issue in our household of trying to get, and I know that a lot of it is avoidance and, you know, escapism and just staying up and watching Netflix and um, but thank you for what you have said, because during that, I sent her a text and I said, Hey, are you doing anything tonight? Um, I'd like to spend some time with you. And she goes, sure, that'd be great. So I don't Sometimes know. Sometimes asking. Yes. <laughs> we may just go in the car and go for a ride or something and chat, but, um, thank you very much. It's very practical and in the moment and it worked. So Good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. And you know, I mean, like if your kid is otherwise safe and healthy, if they stay up for 26 hours, this is one of those acceptable risks. Okay. I don't, I don't like it if it comes on a daily, you know, if that's a regular pattern, that's not good for their brain development, but that falls in the category of let them see how that feels. And, exactly. and they will learn, you know, you can tell them, hey, you should have a regular sleep and wake time. You can preach that to them, but they're going to experiment with that right about now. <laughs> and there's probably not a safer time to do it. They're not driving anywhere. They're not, right. um, you know, th the classes are flexible, you know, as long as they're getting their stuff done, you can allow some movement around those particular things. Okay. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. Did you like the stuff on the teenage brain? Isn't that different to think about yes. it from that perspective? Yes, absolutely. I was sending her screenshots of your <laughs> station. As, of course, I couldn't get her to come and join and, and watch it in real time, but uh, I think I got my point across. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, Are there any other questions? Any attendees? Would you like to hop in and, and pose a question? Well, okay. perhaps you have answered everyone's questions because you had, uh, you covered things so thoroughly. I pre greatly appreciate this presentation, Bloom. Yes, I'm, I'm very glad to do it. It's always fun. I love teenagers, actually. Now, I don't have them of my own yet, but um, <laughs> although my son is beginning. Are you, is yours, Carrie, the 10-year-old? Not yet. We're getting some of these some some signs of that but we're still I think he's a young 10 so he's a young 10. mine's an old 10 and has been always kind of old in his mind and so um we're definitely getting some of that and so you know the the process of navigating it begins uh, I know <laughs> I'm not ready for it um but I used to work with teenagers you know, a lot in my, I mean, I do work with teenagers a lot in my clinical practice, but I also used to, um, you know, back before I went to graduate school, I was a teacher. And so, you know, I, w I worked with that group and I, I actually really love them. I think that they're really neat. Um, and they're, they can, they can, you know, take so much from what you give if, if you give it in the right way. I, I really love the age group. I love middle schoolers. I'm very unusual in that. A lot of people don't, but I love middle schoolers. I think they're really very interesting and, and, and cool kids. I taught, I taught fifth grade and predominantly I taught some other grades as well, but I really loved my fifth graders at the end of the year, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a special person to love a middle schooler and a teenager. I, <laughs> I, enjoy that. I enjoyed them thoroughly. Well, with that, this concludes our series on our parenting in a pandemic. And did you have something else? Something oh, I just, the, someone said, great information. Thank you so much. Just wanted to share that. Dr. I'm Blood. so glad. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, very much so. I just Good. want to remind all the attendees to be on the lookout for a follow-up email with some resources, as well as the post-webinar survey that will open in your browser at the conclusion of tonight's session. Your feedback is very valuable in the planning of all of our programs, and we really appreciate you taking the time to do to complete that survey. And we just want to thank everyone for attending this evening, as well as a huge thank you to Dr. Bloom for sharing her expertise with us. And we hope that you share this informa the information about all of our, our webinars within this series that have been recorded with other parents, even outside of the bleeding disorders community, who could use some support through these uncertain times. 
Again, this session was recorded as was all of our parenting webinars. So be on the lookout for that recording to be posted on HFA social media outlet and our YouTube channel for future reference. If you have any question, questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at HFA programs at hemophiliafed.org. And I just wanna say thank you again to Dr. Bloom and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.